In the uncharted corridors of biblical scholarship, where truths are often veiled and revelations are hard fought, lurks a narrative of intrigue and scandal, a tale that challenges the very foundation of faith. This narrative spins around two socially esteemed figures, Brooke Foss Westcott and Fenton John Anthony Hort, who dared to reshape the contours of biblical understanding with their audacious construction of a new Greek text. As we delve deeper into this labyrinth of deceit and heresy, we will unmask the insidious tactics employed by Westcott and Hort, which not only threatened the sanctity of biblical texts, but also threatened to undermine the authentic manuscripts. Their supposedly groundbreaking Greek text was not just an academic exercise, but a vessel through which they propagated their unconventional doctrines, doctrines that deviated shockingly from the Word of God. Join us as we uncover the inception of the epidemic. Simonides, understanding that the truth will never be accepted, hopelessly gave up and in 1864 left England. In 1870, a number of men who opposed Simonides would become involved in the new committee to revise the King James Bible. The committee was led by Fenton John Anthony Hort, the friend of Tregelles, who was among the first to embrace the Codex Sinaiticus. It was under his leadership that the committee would create a new Greek text in fulfillment of what Tischendorf had written in 1866. Their foundation for this new work was based on the Codex Vaticanus and the Codex Sinaiticus. Hort seems to have been motivated by a hatred for the traditional Greek of the Reformation. He referred to it as villainous and as that vile Textus Receptus. His devout partner was an Anglican bishop named B. F. Westcott. Hort and Westcott uh, were college students together. They formed what was a lifetime bond and a sharing of ideas. And in those days, communication was by letters and uh, they very frequently wrote each other throughout their life. Uh, in the, by their biographies written by their sons, there are hundreds of their letters back and forth. But within some of those letters are things of theological significance. They seem to write each other about all the major details of their lives. But they began as college students, which is not an unusual thing. Other committee members included Tregelles, along with F.H.A. Scrivener. It is interesting to note that the committee also invited John Henry Newman, who was, at the time, a Catholic priest. And while he declined the offer, their invitation reveals much about the theological opinions of Westcott and Hort. Undeniably, there are clear correlations between various Bible translations and Roman Catholicism. Brooke Foss Westcott and Fenton John Anthony Hort, considered as prominent figures in the translation process, could confidently be classified as Anglo-Catholics. Their actions and beliefs are reflective of the significant Tractarian movement that was occurring within the Anglican Church during their lifetime. This movement, led by John Henry Newman, who later became a cardinal in the Roman Catholic Church, sought to integrate numerous Roman Catholic practices into Anglicanism. Other key contributors to this movement included John Keeble and Edward Bouverie Pusey, among others, who collectively endeavored to align Anglicanism more closely with Roman Catholicism. During this period, approximately 200 Anglicans converted to Roman Catholicism, and in the year 2011, nearly a thousand Anglican ministers were prepared to convert. Hence, the phenomenon of the Anglo-Catholic movement has been a continuing presence not just solely within England, but beyond. 
It is crucial to note that Westcott and Hort found themselves at the epicenter of this movement, contributing to the fervor associated with integrating Roman Catholic doctrines into the Anglican Church. At one point, Westcott described seeing a Pieta statue of the Catholic Mary holding the dead body of Jesus. He wrote, Had I been alone, I could have knelt there for hours. And Hort said that there's no difference between Jesus worship and Mary worship in its cruises and effects. It's worth considering that when Westcott and Hort finished their revision of the King James Bible, their new Greek text was openly condemned by Dean John Bergen, who published a critique titled, The Revision Revised. In it, he said, I frankly confess that to me all this looks very much indeed like what, in the language of lawyers, is called conspiracy. Bergen then wrote that the revision of 1881 was inaccurate and said it exhibits defective scholarship in countless places. He openly declared that Westcott and Hort had created a new Greek text. Bergen wrote that it is the systematic deprivation of the underlying Greek which does so grievously offend me. For this is nothing else but a poisoning of the river of life at its sacred source. Our revisers, with the best and purest intentions no doubt, stand convicted of having deliberately rejected the words of inspiration in every page and of having substituted for them fabricated readings which the church has long since refused to acknowledge or else has rejected with abhorrence and which only survive at this time in a little handful of documents of the most depraved type. Dean John Bergen would declare that the revision of 1881 must come to be universally regarded as what it most certainly is, the most astonishing as well as the most calamitous literary blunder of the age. One of Bergen's books answering them entitled Excursions in Cloudland. He said, this is just nonsense. And he was challenging the popular ideas of the day, but he's saying, where's the evidence? Uh, and pointing out these men have a bias against the idea of an authoritative text. And so they've come up with these theories, and he's asking, how do you know Lucius existed? How do you know this recension took place in the 400s? How do, how do you know this, and how do you know that? How do you know Sinaiticus is reliable, etc.? And he's asking for evidence. Don't have any. And in his day, he was considered being a troublemaker. I, I've read a number of his books, and I don't find any of them at all unreasonable. He just asked lots of questions. And then he drew, he said, since they can't answer these questions, there has to be a reason why they can't answer them. Why is it they cannot answer questions like historical references for the recension? Why can't they tell you what the historical references are that says this happened? It's because it never happened. Well, he was saying something that the majority of people did not want to hear. But he created a real backlash to them that did matter. For example, they wanted their English translation to become the new authorized translation, authorized by the Church of England. There was a great deal of talk about that. But Bergen's writings and speaking created such a backlash, they felt they had to hold off. Hold off. They could not make it the authorized version. Too many people were asking too many questions. And excursion, ex Excursions in Cloudland was a tremendous name. He said they're just imagining what they want, and, and they were. FHA Scrivener served on the committee with Westcott and Hort. He voiced many objections to their theory and their conclusions. In the end, he was so troubled by their work that he eventually published his own rebuttal. He said, Dr. Hort's system is entirely destitute of historical foundation. We are compelled to repeat as emphatically as ever our strong conviction that the hypothesis 
to whose proof he has devoted so many laborious years, is destitute not only of historical foundation, but of all probability. Elevating to prominence, Brooke Foss Westcott and Fenton John Anthony Hort discreetly compiled a new Greek text. This text is fundamentally rooted in the contested documents from the Vatican and Sinai. Moreover, tracing its lineage further, it also draws significantly from Griesbach's Unitarian text. Griesbach begins to advocate the idea that we've been using the wrong texts all these centuries. It's an idea that Westcott and Hort would later uh, flesh out, make popular, and would make it as the background for their theology. But the idea really begins with him. You mentioned in your question his Unitarian background. So, I mean, why did he like these alternative texts? Had a reason for liking them. And um, it was because in many, many places, not everywhere, but in many, many places, references to the deity of Christ were left out. And, and so Griesbach has the theory that, you know, uh, these people come along and they want to prove the deed of Christ even though it's not in the Bible So they keep sticking it in there that all the references to the deity of Christ were fake and They discredited manuscripts if it mentions the deed of Christ it's discredited Westcott and Hort take that concept and build the idea of let's do a proper collection of the text and let's do a proper translation of the text and um, he sets the stage. He was not in the hierarchy of the Church of England, and so he didn't have a vehicle for his ideas. Westcott and Hort picked them up. They have a vehicle. Their vehicle is to try and get the Church of England to accept this, to promote it, to persuade it. And uh, they managed, to, it looked like they were gonna get that done. They get a certain direction. Church of England authorizes them to do a revision of the King James Bible. They want to do more because they want to use their text rather than their receive text. Authorizes them to look at collection of a new Greek text. Authorizes them to do a new translation of the English Bible. And while they did not succeed in getting the Church of England to endorse either at the end of the day, they changed the discussion. But he laid the foundation. Johann Jakob Griesbach was a 19th century German scholar who is often called the father of modern textual criticism. Westcott and Hort declared that the name of Griesbach was a name we venerate above that of every other textual critic of the New Testament. Scrivener wrote that their new textual theory was built upon the thinking of Griesbach as well as other textual critics who presented alternative views to the traditional Greek text. He said, The germ of this theory can be traced in the speculations of Bentley and Griesbach, but there is little hope for the stability of their imposing structure. If its foundations have been laid on the sandy ground of ingenious conjecture, the conjecture Scrivener referred to had to do with the theory of Dr. Hort, who claimed that sometimes between 250 and 350 AD, the original texts of the Bible were deliberately altered by certain church leaders at Antioch in ancient Syria. This was supposedly followed by a second revision that took place later on. During these revisions, Words and verses were supposedly added to the Bible and resulted in the longer readings which are found in the Textus Receptus, or the traditional text used by the Reformers. Hort argued that Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus contained shorter readings overall because they had not been contaminated by this alleged revision process at Antioch. Scrivener argued that Hort's theory was completely imaginary. Of this twofold authoritative revision of the Greek text, not one trace remains in the history of Christian antiquity. 
you know, you have Vaticanus and Sinaiticus in the Gospels alone, they do not agree with each other more than 3,000 times. And, um, you know, a lot of that is based upon the false theory of the Lucian recension. There is no evidence of uh, such a, a thing ever happening. And uh, so uh, when you look at some of the things that are in Vaticanus and Sinaiticus that are not in the New Testament, and then the books that were left out of Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, um, there are 99% uh, of all the manuscript evidence that we have, manuscripts and portions, would agree with the traditional text. And so when you have all of that evidence and you go back and add to that the early Latin in the Peshettas and find out that all of the stuff is there, um, the shortness is uh, not something to be lauded. Um, there were so many books that have even been left out of Vaticanus and Sinaiticus and the 3,000 differences just in the gospel would lead me to be very wary of uh, a, a believing that argument because of all of the manuscript evidence that we have otherwise. Dean Bergen also argued that Westcott and Hort defied the original instructions for the revision, which required that they abstain from all but necessary changes. He further claimed that they secretly introduced their new Greek text to form the foundation for the new revision. I trace the mischief home to its true authors, Drs. Westcott and Hort, a copy of whose unpublished text of the New Testament, the most vicious in existence, had been confidentially and under pledges of the strictest secrecy, placed in the hands of every member of the revising body. Westcott and Hort implemented a strategic approach wherein they distributed their meticulously crafted text, a project they had been working on for 11 years, to each of the revivers involved. They imposed a strict condition stipulating that under no circumstances were the committee members to disclose the existence of this alternative Greek text. This tactic was surreptitiously executed, ensuring the novel text was subtly introduced into the review process. According to Dean Bergen, Westcott and Hort had already created their new Greek text and then began to convince the committee to accept it. Hort himself is said to have been the decisive leader in promoting the historical theory behind it. Bergen writes, The revisionists had, in an evil hour, surrendered themselves to Dr. Hort's guidance. However, the looming question still resides. Why would Hort develop such an implausible theory and then insist upon using it to alter the original Greek text of the New Testament? In Hort's own words, he wanted to dethrone the villainous Textus Receptus. Did not want to be bound by authoritative Bible. Wanted to be fluid. Wanted people to be able to be creative. And he would even suggest it's a violation of the priest of the believer to say we're bound by text. When I would say that's what the priest of the believer is about, being bound by a text, rather than bound by a theological organization. But um, that was his, his clear motive. He, he, that even makes it a little bit into his public writing. His son goes into it in great detail. And it was something that he and Westcott uh, communicated about and shared. It became known as the Hort Theory because he may have been the loudest about it, but it was a theory, that, certainly a theory that they shared. And he wanted to be set free from having an authoritative text. You know, people like you and I be able to say, you're wrong, you know why you're wrong? Here it is in the book. The concept of the book it was not to have because it takes away from man's pride, very much like the, the doctrine of salvation by faith alone cripples man's pride. 
I couldn't do anything to add to it. The Lord did it all. It slaps my pride. The Bible is the authority. When I disagree with the Bible, being a human being, sometimes I do. When I disagree with the Bible, guess who's wrong? Every single time. They did not want an authoritative text of the Bible that held people, their, their words were in captivity. When I would say exactly the opposite. We need to be held in captivity by the Word of God so that we adjust our feelings and our beliefs and our ideas um, and you know, take that position. Well, I, I'd been a preacher for 10 years before I understood all this. I finally came today and I told the Lord, said, from now on, King James Bible is the authority. When I don't understand it, it will still be the authority. I'll study it till I do understand it, but it will still be the authority till I get it figured out. And um, they did not want that. There was an element in the Church of England that did. Still a small element in the Church of England that does. In the 1800s, that element produced some great books. Hard to get a hold of now, but they can be gotten. They're being reprinted by various people. Uh, but that was it. They said, we have an authoritative Bible no matter what these guys say. No matter what cloud land they're off uh, having excursions in, we have an authoritative Bible. That was always the debate and still is the debate. At the age of 23, in 1851, Hort expressed a significant realization to a friend. He stated, Until the past few weeks, I had not grasped the paramount importance of textual authenticity. My experience with the Greek Testament was limited, and I was reluctantly dealing with the highly unsatisfactory Textus Receptus, a text that predominantly relies on later manuscripts. This insight proved to be formative, shaping his lifelong perspective on the matter. Despite his limited exposure to the Greek Testament at that point in his life, he arrived at this critical conclusion. To quote from the Gospel of Mark, it seems evident that an enemy hath done this, referencing the parable of the wheat and tares. It underscores the adverse influence in the matter of establishing a reliable text. After Westcott and Hort died, their private letters were published and shed light on some of their beliefs. Hort appears to have kept his own doctrinal views secret while working with Westcott on the New Greek text, fearing that it might be rejected because of his heretical views. Writing to Westcott in 1861, Hort said, Also, but this may be cowardice, I have a sort of craving that our texts should be cast upon the world before we deal with matters likely to brand us with suspicion. I mean, a text issued by men already known for what will undoubtedly be treated as dangerous heresy will have great difficulty in finding its way into regions which it might otherwise hope to reach. Of course, I felt this doubt all along, but made it give way to the necessities of our joint plan. This joint plan was a series of essays they intended to publish, which Dr. Hort believed would reveal their unorthodox views. They had been authorized by the Church of England to be part of an attempt uh, to revise the King James Bible. You always hear the same argument. Go in and deal with the archaic words and all that. It's the same, but just the wording's a little more modern. And that's all they were authorized to do. When they got there, they begin to lobby for a whole new translation. And they begin to lobby for a whole new translation based on their Greek New Testament rather than the received text. Scrivener, who was a part of it in the early process, said it wasn't really a theological debate as much as it was Hort overpowering everybody in argument. And you know, some people, that's just their personality and that's their ability. According to Scrivener, that was Hort. No matter what evidences you gave or arguments you made, the force of his personality carried the debate. And Scrivener left. He didn't want to be part of that. And other, other folks that left didn't want to be part of it. Other folks refused to participate in the beginning because um, a Unitarian pastor had been uh, nominated to be one of the translators. And um, 
Some of the folks said, we're not going to have a Unitarian. Westcott and Hort said he will be part of the translation committee. Their word carried enough weight. And, uh, but that was their plan. So we want to release a Greek New Testament, which was their work, and the New English Bible, which they had dominated in the translation of, and they wanted it authorized by the Church of England. And it's moving along until Bergen, as we said earlier, creates such a reaction to it that the leadership of the Church of England just, eh, we, we can't do that right now. We can't go that far. The public won't accept it because too many questions have been asked that they couldn't answer. Beyond the personal and heterodox beliefs held by Westcott and Hort, there lies an even more profound foundation of unorthodox views serving as the underpinning for these individuals and their propagated distortions. These distortions have sought to modify the core principles of Christianity and the authenticity of the original manuscripts. Furthermore, these untruths have been disseminated to generations with the intent to obscure their understanding and divert attention from the actual narrative at play. Join us next time as we uncover part two of The Inception. Hi, I'm Jeff Quigley. I'm the voice behind Truth Prevaileth. And I wanted to take just a brief moment and give you an explanation of how you can know God as your Father in Heaven and the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior from the cross of Calvary. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. There is one name and one name only in all of creation by which we can have access to God in heaven. That's the name Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. You need to know today that you were born a sinner. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now to come short of that glory means that we cannot attain to that glory. The Bible says that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. There's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 6.23 says there's a penalty for that sin. That verse says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes, it's true. God sent His only begotten Son to die on the cross for our sins. Why would He do that? Well, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Jesus paid the debt for your sins. Romans 5.8 says, But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You can accept this free gift of salvation today. It's as simple as what the Bible says in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. It says, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Verse 10 says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Verse number 13 of Romans chapter 10 says this, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now you may say, well, Pastor Quigley, I believe in God. I know there's a God. Oh, the Bible says the devil believes as well, and he trembles. See, it's more than just belief in a God. You've got to accept the fact that that God gave his only begotten son to pay the debt for your sins. Won't you consider these things today? I pray that you will. 
Until next time, God bless you.